Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to another seminar from the Write Like Them series. This is actually the last one in our current series for this fall semester. We'll see if we'll do another one in the spring, and we may. If there's anything you'd like us to do, Don, make sure you drop in the comments or let us know over at Writers and Community from the ODU MFA program on Facebook, or you can find us. Uh, but today, what we're going to be discussing is my year of rest and relaxation from Motessa Moshfeg. And one of the things I really like to look at, especially in this novel, is that you have a very unlikable narrator. A narrator who is someone who purposely goes out of their way to actually brings out some of their worst qualities. And what I wanted to look at is how do we make that narrator not only effective and compelling, but make us um, as a reader interested in her life. We are not introduced to our unnamed narrator in any kind of way, um, especially in my year of rest and relaxation. That would make us really like her. I'll start off with a little reading from the beginning. Uh, this will be page one in the PDF and uh, page one that I'm reading from right now. One. Whenever I woke up, night or day, I'd shuffle through the bright marble foyer of my building and go up the block and around the corner where there was a bodega that never closed. I'd get two large coffees with cream and six sugars each. Chug the first one in the elevator on the way back up to my apartment, then sip the second slowly while I watched movies and ate animal crackers and took trazodone and ambium and nembutol until I fell asleep again. I lost track of my time in this way. Days passed. Weeks. A few months went by when I thought of it. I ordered delivery from the Thai place, from the Thai restaurant across the street, or a tuna salad platter from the diner on First Avenue. I'd wake up to find voice messages on my cell phone from salons or spas confirming appointments I'd booked in my sleep. I always called back to cancel, which I hated doing because I hated talking to people. This is as like a, a first paragraph really is a masterclass in introducing us to this character because we have a character who gives us her entire situation in the first paragraph. Uh, she is a person who is literally using stimulants through caffeine and then all of these sedatives and psychotropic drugs later on to put herself into kind of this medically induced state of non-existence. And what I always love is how she ends the paragraph. It's not something that really, um, it's something that calls the reader into question because it says, I always called back to cancel, which I hated doing because I hated talking to people. The reader is then forced to ask himself the question, well, why do you hate talking to people? It's this really beautiful movement that Otessa does actually throughout her novels and really throughout her paragraph structures, which is always ending, um, if we think like kind of how we end a chapter on a turn, so that when you turn the next page, you are uh, expecting the immediate answer to the previous question posed. That's what creates momentum between chapters and novels. She does the very similar effect within her paragraph structure itself. And that effect is really the magic of making us uh, see this narrator and question why she is how she is. The unlikable elements are introduced and in some ways really kind of painted for us, especially within the internal drama of the scene. But what I really enjoy is how Otessa takes that ideal and turns the nastiness as to why does she feel this way. So you're not asking the reader to sympathize with the character, but you are asking the reader on a different level to be curious about what made them unlikable. And that's really what the good unlikable narrator stories do is they're plumbing the idea of how this person got this way and making the reader interested in asking that question. Another big turn in these first 17 pages that she does is she introduces the secondary character. And secondary characters, especially early on, allow us to have a point of, um, I should say, abstraction from our main character. They allow us to see our main character in a different way that the main character sees themselves, but also allows the reader to see the entire narrative in a different perspective because, again, you're getting a different ideal um, from the outside of the first-person narrator. Um, all of the word choice when we think about first-person narrators, our first-person point of view, is all from the internal. Everything they're saying, the word choice, comes from their internal voice. So when we use outside characters, they're really key for the reader to actually understand what's going on in the narrative. So the introduction of Riva as her best friend really does allow the story to give you a different side of our narrator. Uh, this reading right here is from page number seven. And to set it up a bit, we've already been introduced to Reva as a concept of a best friend, but more of an annoying best friend. She constantly comes over and is drinking, and even though that they've known each other for a long time, our narrator doesn't really necessarily think she likes Reva anymore. So I'll hop into this. It's the middle of page seven, again in the PDF. I loved Reva, but I didn't like her anymore. We'd been friends since college, long enough that all we had left in common was our history together, a complex circuit of resentment, memory, jealousy, denial, and a few dresses I'd let Rafa borrow, which she promised to dry clean in return, but never did. She worked as an executive assistant for an insurance brokerage firm in Midtown. 
She was an only child, a gym rat, had a blotchy red birthmark on her neck in the shape of Florida, a chewing gum habit that gave her TMJ and breath that reeked of cinnamon and green apple candy. She liked to come over to my place, clear a space for herself on the armchair, comment at the state of the apartment, say I looked like I'd lost more weight, and complain about work, all while refilling her wine glass after every sip. People don't understand what it's like for me, she said. They take it for granted that I'm always going to be cheerful. Meanwhile, these assholes think they're going to go around treating everyone, blow them like shit. Am I supposed to giggle and look cute and send their faxes? Fuck them. Let them all go bald and burn in hell. So what's really fun about that is you get, first of all, Reva being somebody who is very um, interested in her life and the fact that our narrator isn't. Our narrator is kind of detaching from her life, cocooning herself. And in so many ways, even though we know more about our narrator's current situation, we are given very little about her life, whereas with Reva, we're almost given a capsule biography. But we are also given her station in life and how she works. And we don't have that about the narrator, but what it does is it allows that external lens to be focused on the narrator. So again, it's an act of perception that even the narrator themselves may not be aware of, but is still working on the narrative to paint this unlikable narrator in different point of view. She is not the only unlikable person. What we get is we get Reva, who is a good person who, again, the narrator has said literally that she loves, but is a complicated person and it isn't always a person somebody wants to be around. So by creating somebody who may not be as disagreeable or rather as a kind of in uh, such a poor place of their life as our narrator, but still somebody who looks at the world with a slight lens of disgust, we're allowed to, in comparison, feel our narrator m less as an unlikable character and more as a complex person who does unlikable things. And even though that unlikable element still stays in there, the acknowledgement of the complexity within the early pages, again, allows you to plumb that question of how did this complex person become this unlikable versus just being interested in an unlikable person doing an unlikable thing. Kind of the last master movement I really wanted to look at in this chapter was um, on page 17 itself, the end of that first section before we get kind of our first big section break and we move forward towards kind of like the specifics of her hibernation when she goes into kind of how she became this unlikable person. It's this really beautiful section where the narrator actually pushes Reva away in a very direct manner. Um, I'll actually start on page 16, it finishes on page 17 from the middle of the page down. I pulled the sweater down to take a drag of my cigarette. She batted the smoke out of her face and fake coughed. Then she turned to me. She was trying to embolden herself by making eye contact with the enemy. I could see the fear in her eyes as though she were staring into a black hole she thought might, she might fall into. At least I'm making an effort to change and go after what I want, she said. Besides sleeping, what do you want out of life? I chose to ignore her sarcasm. I wanted to be an artist, but I had no talent, I told her. Do you really need talent? That might have been the smartest thing Reva ever said to me. Yes, I replied. She got up and tick-tocked across the floor in her heels and shut the door softly behind her. I took a few Xanax and ate a few animal crackers and stared at the wrinkled seat of the empty armchair. I got up and put in the tin cup and watched it half-heartedly as I dozed on the sofa. Reva called half an hour later and left a voicemail, saying she'd already forgiven me for hurting her feelings, that she was worried about my health that she loved me and wouldn't abandon me, no matter what. My jaw unclenched to listening to the message, as though I'd been gritting my teeth for days. Maybe I had been. Then I pictured her sniffling through uh, Christie's, uh, picking out the food she'd eat at and vomit up. Her loyalty was absurd. This is what kept us going. You'll be fine, I told Reva, when she'd said her mother was starting a third round of chemo. Don't be a spaz, I said, when her mother's cancer spread to her brain. And this is kind of like the battle of the unlikable characters right now. It's uh, Reva kind of overstepping bounds at the same time as our narrator refusing to come out of this cocoon and acknowledge another human is worthy of her presence, which is this really beautiful push and pull between uh, Reva and our narrator. And how it ends on our narrator again constantly shirking off emotion towards Reva, even when her mother's cancer spreads to her brain. We understand the push and pull between this dynamic and the relationship, and this is kind of how Otess is tricking us into liking the character more. Because the character uses humor to both deflect the actual reality around her, but she's also using this humor as a shield for Reva who feels everything so intensely. You're getting two sides of a spectrum, and neither side is healthy, but between them exists a relationship of need and want that is propelling both forward in the relationship. One of my favorite lines here, her loyalty was absurd. This was what kept us going. 
It was the loyalty towards one another, even though it was unacknowledged and really unappreciated on one side, which Reva really gives to the narrative in this kind of first movement. Reva really stays as a character throughout the rest of the novel. And this novel really begins to become about their relationship as the crux point, which kind of folds everything of the narrator into the fold as we learn more about her through the novel. Um, but again, we learn about her so slowly, we learn about Reva so quickly, so that character is allowed to take up that extra narrative momentum and be the point at which we really become involved in a narrative, even though our narrator is the individual who is in the turmoil and who are, whom we are following. So what Atessa does is it allows us to have, again, this outside point to both drive narrative and build meaning in ways that we don't traditionally have an unlikable narrator narratives, um, especially for being an unnamed unlikable narrator that just does so many terrible things to other people, but constantly shows us how within those relationships, the actions matter to both the past, present, and future of the character. It's a through line of very clean narrative that you don't get very often anymore because we're so like obsessed with complex, beautiful, you know, multi-layered structured narratives. We're looking at very complex characters and complex characters whom we may not want to associate with if we came across them on a regular day, are able to live within their life and see them more clearly for what they are, which is, again, complex creatures, uh, not necessarily strictly unlikable. So I really adore how she sets that up. And I really do wish uh, everybody would go pick up this novel. It is a fantastic novel. Uh, I'm really excited. I had a ton of fun doing this series, um, but I will talk about narrative to anybody for hours. So if you guys have any suggestions for next semester, I might do two or three of these next semester, at least on the video side. If anybody wants a specific book or wants me to look at something, I'm always more than happy to do it. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope to uh, talk to you guys again next uh, semester.